Hello again, and welcome back to Lost in Translation. My name is Nico, and this week we're looking at the Torah portion, Baha Alotcha, uh, and the 10 things that you will miss if you read the portion only in English. So we will start right away with Toward the Face. Okay, uh, it's kind of curious that this passage starts with uh, lighting of the menorah. We just had all of the princely gifts arrive. And now um, we're being reminded about uh, the lighting of the menorah and how it's constructed and how the instructions were given. And right here at the very beginning, we're told that the lights, that the, the lamps shall cast their light towards the face of the menorah. And we have to ask what's that about, right? I mean, light spreads everywhere. But, you know, it's, it's, we understand that the menorah was constructed in a way that the right branch and the left branch would cast the light towards the center you know, of the menorah. And we understand that this teaches us that you know, all of our pursuits, whether they are spiritual pursuits or they are corporeal pursuits, all of our pursuits should be centered towards uh, towards the divine. And uh, ultimately, that's what the light of the menorah comes to teach us. Okay, number two. And wave. Okay, so now we know that the Levites were set apart and that they were going to replace the firstborns. They were going to be the consecration of the firstborn of all of Israel. And now in order to, to lift the, uh, the Levites to their new station, Aaron and Moshe are, going, are, are both being told to lift them up physically, wait as a wave offering before the Lord, right? Like a nefta, right here. I mean, we know about wave offerings. These are these are portions of the sacrifices that are lifted up and waved before the altar. So now we have this idea that all these thousands of of Levites are going to be lifted up once by Moshe Rabbeinu and once by Aaron Akonin. And are they really, okay, yes, you, you can consider that they're gonna pick up every person. It's gonna be quite the task. Or we could also understand that again, the Torah is speaking about spirituality. Now we do physical things that are representative of spirituality. So were the Levites all physically lifted? It's very possible. And at the same time, we have to understand what this is spiritually representing, right? That if Moshe Rabbeinu draws us up, right? He's lifting, he's drawing up the whole tribe of the Levites, including I mean, he's a member of that. He's drawing them up to this new service to the priesthood. Right? They're not priests, but they are to serve the priesthood, right? And then you have Aaron Cohen, who is doing this wave service again for a different reason, to, to basically inaugurate them as representatives of, of the whole nation. So, okay. Are they being lifted up physically? Wow, that's a monumental task. And it's very likely that this could be done. Um, but more importantly, it's to understand that, that 
this group of people is, is held to a higher standard of, uh, of spirituality and that eventually all of us in the nation are supposed to lift them up as well and to hold them in regard and that they give this give us an opportunity to to afford someone respect um, for no other reason but of their station and that's also something that helps us come out of our own egoism number three the second Pesach. Okay, the very next chapter goes into the first Passover uh, in the wilderness. And, you know, we Passover is a requirement, we have to observe it. Um, not observing the Passover um, is, you know, it's the, the it's, it's a big problem spiritually. And it removes us from our, uh, from our people, right? Talked about Kevet before. Now, the first thing that the Torah does, understanding that impurity is possible, right? Especially given, I mean, they give us the example of people who are impure or here in the Chabad translation, they were ritually unclean because of the contact with a dead person, a corpse, Right, so what do they do? They're they're meant to observe Passover, but they're they're unclean, so they can't they can't give a sacrifice. Now today we don't have this problem because we're not offering sacrifices at the temple, but you know we we do we do go through. Uh, I mean, it's before these holidays we go into the mikvah we go through a, a ritual purity process and if there was for some reason that somebody was not able to observe this first passover the torah gives us a way out there's a second passover it's the next month over right the very next month uh somebody should uh should observe the passover on the same day and they could offer their passover sacrifice on that on that day of the next month um, so what is this telling us about spirituality? Well, basically, we understand that impurity is part of life. And we also understand that we're meant to observe commandments in order to come closer to Hashem. And Hashem is never going to put us in a position where our impurity is going to lead us to, uh, punishment that is irreversible right so when somebody dies in our family we have an obligation to become impure we are obligated to take care of that body now we can't have those obligations pinch us into a spiritual excision right so for this reason we're being shown that the torah and our path in Torah mitzvot, there will always be a way to observe everything that will never be stuck in a way that, uh, that we're uh, unable to fulfill our spiritual responsibilities. Number four. By the word of Hashem. Now we're starting to get this idea of what life was like in the wilderness. Um, we see the first Passover offering. We see that there is a second opportunity for a Passover offering. And now we're starting to get an idea of what it was like for the camp to be set up with the different tribes around the tabernacle. And here we're seeing that how they would travel, okay? And we're being told that, you know, this pillar of cloud was always upon the tabernacle by day. And this pillar of fire was there at night. And this is the same pillar of fire and pillar of cloud that was leading the, uh, 
the nation of Israel out of Egypt. Um, the same the same pillars that confounded the Egyptian army. So there's this constant, constant reminder of Hashem's presence among the camp. The camp is a very holy place. Um, and if you could see this, if this was part of your daily experiment, experience, that there's always this cloud and pillar of fire, it'd be impossible to forget your obligations to Torah. I mean, you would... I mean, yes, you still have the capacity to 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 sin or to to make mistakes, um, but it's going to be more difficult with that that pillar before you all the time. And so we also learn that it's only when this pillar itself would get up and move that the that the nation would follow it to its next resting place. Right, and so we're told that the uh, you know that here it's at the bidding of the Lord, right? So, okay, by the by, uh, how do we see it here? According to the word of Hashem, uh, the bidding of of. Of, uh, of Hashem, right? It, that they would follow what Hashem commanded, both spiritually and physically. And again, there's this connection between the two. And we too can place that pillar of cloud and fire in our minds and in our hearts so that we too follow wherever that pillar brings us. And that pillar is the Torah. There is no other, there is no other pillar for us to find. And it is just as miraculous as the uh, as the pillar of, of cloud and fire that must have been before, that's described as being before this camp in the wilderness. Okay, number five. Silver trumpets. Okay, the next uh, the next chapter starts with Moshe Rabbeinu being commanded to make two silver trumpets. Asa lecha, make for yourself. Right. So this is this is interesting. We can understand that these trumpets were made that. Moshe Rabbeinu would make them for his own personal use, right? And it is taught that these trumpets were not used after uh, after Moshe Rabbeinu died, um, that they were hidden. Now, it's also interesting that the, one of the primary functions here was that when the trumpets would sound, this is when the camps would get up and start moving. So we already saw that the nation of Israel would start to travel when uh, the cloud lifted up off of the tabernacle. And now we have this second confirmation that, okay, the cloud's gotten up. Now the trumpets are, are blasting. It's time to, to move, right? And there are other reasons why the trumpets were used. If we needed to assemble the elders or to assemble the nation, the trumpets were used to assemble people, the, the nation. Um, and so we were given this other form, this other sensory form, this confirmation of the word of Hashem through Moshe Rabbeinu, right? And again, if this, if this column of cloud and fire is the Torah for us. The the trumpets are are Moshe Rabbeinu who who delivered the Torah to us, and through these two senses, through the sight of the Torah itself and the acceptance of the teachings through our ears, right? That this is how we can come to move through the wilderness. Uh, so to speak. 
our spiritual wilderness to come closer to Hashem. Number six. To my land. Okay, so here we're getting ready to travel and Moshe Rabbeinu speaks to his father-in-law, right? Um, and his father-in-law, Jethro, Hobab, um, Wayuel, he, there's several names that are associated with him. And uh, what's interesting here is that, is that, okay, maybe these names that are used are signifying qualitative changes as it becomes closer to the, uh, to the nation of Israel, right? The uh, name of Chobab, it's like Chiba, it's like, uh, like love that he became, you know, that maybe he, he had a love for Torah, some people teach, or that he just came closer to the quality of Hashem, which is, which is love. Right, and he's being told, "Come on, come with us to Israel. We're we're on our way." And he responds, "Okay." And in, in the Chabad translation, "I will go to the land of my birthplace." But really, it's saying, uh, "El Artsi, my land. Eretz or Aretz is land." And this. E at the end is possessive. I'm going to go back to my land. Okay. And why he's choosing this, it's it's not certain, but there is, even though he's come closer to Israel, he's not ready to join the nation. He's still separate. He has some other desire, something that's not 100% in connection to the nation. And now this is when their separation happens. He goes to his land and the nation of Israel is supposed to go to their land. And we're gonna see what happens. Number seven. The rabble. Okay, this is when things start to go pear-shaped. Now people start to understand, wait, we're leaving Sinai. The honeymoon is over. We're starting to travel deep into the wilderness and populated areas are not going to be very close by. And we're moving towards what's supposed to be a hostile territory, right? And the people, Ha'am, the nation, were looking to complain. And of course, this, this made Hashem, this made Hashem uh, angry, right? I mean, it's the same way that a father might feel when uh, a child is sticking his nose up at the food that he's prepared or, or you know, and, and here we're seeing the word being used here in, uh, in uh, the Chabad translations, multitude, to remind us that there was this mixed multitude from Egypt that came up with the nation, and that now maybe these people are starting to show their, their true colors, right? The... Uh, the asasuf, right? Kind of rabble. The uh, you know these these aren't these these aren't very I don't know they it's a different class of people, right? And they are instigating complaints and they are influencing the rest of the nation, teaching us that the company we keep is important, right? that the people we draw close to, that we become like them. And we should seek to be close to scholars, to professionals, to good people, so that we can assume their good qualities and we all rise together. And because even a good person, well, a, a good, strong person among poor people, bad people, uh, they can influence them for the good. But if that good person is weak, they can easily be influenced for the bad. And we're seeing that here, that, you know, that they started having strong cravings, you know, and really they come to say that who's going to feed us meat? But 
There's no shortage of meat. They came out of Egypt with all these huge flocks. Basically, what this is, is a complaint about the manna. They're thinking, how long are we going to be eating this stuff? How long are we going to go out every day and collect this stuff? And like before, you know, Hashem, this is, it's not that Hashem gets angry with us. It's that the egoism that it takes to reject the gifts that Hashem provides us is a quality that removes us from him, right? We perceive the natural response of our environment as Hashem being angry, right? When we reject these blessings, maybe we lose a taste for it. Maybe we're not, we're not happy with it. We're no longer satisfied. And that's our ego getting in the way of all the blessings that we truly have. And really, that's what this rabble is, is the force of egoism inside this nation that wants to be Yeshad Kel, straight to the creator. Number seven. Seventy men. Okay, now after all these complaints, Moshe Rabbeinu also is getting the idea that, hey, wait a second, this journey in the wilderness with all these people might be beyond my capacity. And he prays to Hashem for help, that he doesn't have the power to carry the whole nation by himself. And this is when Hashem offers that help. He says, okay, get, uh, get 70 men, right? And these 70 people are supposed to now help Moshe take the nation with him, right? And he says, yeah, let's see. My power is limited. And he's asking for help. 70 men. Shivim Ish. This is interesting because Ish, one, is uh, it's not a dumb. Um, and but it's it's the, the word for male people, except that it's in the singular. So that we understand that that this multiplication or this 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 uh it's not a division of power to this 70 it's kind of a multiplication of these people that they that they support moshe and they all have this one single authority that they're not meant to all start to become different leaders and maybe end up saying different things that they're all supposed to be elevated in some way closer to the quality of Moshe so that they are all going to be leading in the same way and help this quality of Moshe bring the, uh, the nation to where it needs to go. So this singularity of the person of 70, right? That these 70 men are really so close in quality that their numerical value may be 70 people so that they can help lead a large nation, but their qualitative, their, their, their real quality is singular. And that quality is one that draws the people up just like the quality of Moshe. Number eight, Who will feed us meat? Okay, so here we're going to see more closely why Hashem is angry, right? That uh, we understand that this, this complaint for meat, right, is really a declaration that life was better in Egypt, right? And for us to feel that, it's a rejection of the mission of Israel, of Yeshar Kel. It's the desire to run back into our egoism. 
And you got to think, well, why could that, how could that be possible if you've got this pillar of cloud and fire before you? But in spirituality, it's not only possible, it's inevitable. We're always going to feel the pull of our egoism. We're always going to want to turn our face away from what really feels like a, a sacrifice of our own lives to this principle that we didn't really choose to be part of, that we feel drawn to it and we feel rejected by it at the same time, or we are rejecting it at the same time that we want to draw closer to it. And so there is constantly this issue of Israel moving forward and the ravel of Egypt pulling it back and constantly this separation of the two forces. And okay, the ego wants meat, Hashem's going to give it meat. And uh, we see here that there's so much meat that they end up being sick of it. And so that's what we can do to our ego. We can, we can take it and we can give it that, that thing that it wants to such an extent that it doesn't want anything else. It, it just won't want it anymore. Okay. To be careful with this idea we don't want to be running into uh into extreme practices we don't we don't want to really follow the ego down the hole where it wants to go but there's a way of dealing with the ego of of stuffing it with something that it thought that it wanted in order to put that desire to death and to move forward in our mission to uh, draw closer to Hashem. Number nine, Eldad and Nadad. So Hashem is bringing these seven people up. He's extending his spirit upon them so that they can help Moshe in his mission to draw the, the nation of Israel up. And there are these two people who didn't go to the meeting. Uh, they are among the 70, Eldad and Nedad. And it's interesting here that this, you know, there's this idea of measurement, right? To measure or to, right? That in both of them, right? Maybe El, like God is the measure and medad to uh yeah another kind of measurement um well the other thing here is me uh it's kind of another mystical name for for elohim in fact we have el and im here and these uh these two syllables that are tacked on to this idea of measurement right um and also elohim is a judge right it it measures right and okay they end up prophesizing in the camp and uh and there's this interesting juxtaposition that 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 yoshua ben nun he wants to have these two men incarcerated for prophesizing and uh and Moshe's response is that if, if only all of Israel would prophesize, right? That now and you have this juxtaposition between the rabble who are complaining and these two men who are prophesizing. And that, no, no, instead of the complainers, we would want everybody to be at the level of prophecy, right? And we want, this is, this is the, the unit of measurement. This is how... This is how we want to measure ourselves as well, that, uh, that we should constantly be using these two opposites of the egoism of Egypt and the, the desire to come closer to Hashem, right? This, and to draw the nation up with us, these two opposite qualities exist within us and we use them to measure our exact position in our journey 
towards Hashem. Number 10. Spoke against Moshe. Here we see the first of a series of incidents where we really understand that this, this quality of egoism is more than just Egypt. It's still deeply rooted, even in the highest levels of the nation of Israel, when we have the siblings of Moshe, Miriam and Aaron, they speak against Moshe, right? Now, just like the complaint about meat being a pretext for complaining about the mana, his brother and sister complain about his wife, a Kushite woman, right? Well, okay, so she's not she's not a Hebrew, right? That she's a Haisha Hakushit, which really we understand that she's black African with this word, if we're talking about corporeality, right? She is something other than the, uh, the, uh, the Hebrew nation. And this idea that she, that we can complain about Moshe who has married this woman, right? It's a pretext for their jealousy of his position, because that's what they say right away. Hasn't he spoken to us too? Right? Hello, gam abanu diber va ishma Hashem. Like we, like we, we, we uh, well, he, the, the Lord heard this, right? So that this made him angry. Moses is exceedingly humble and Hashem is angry. Again, is he angry or is he recognizing that this egoism is separating them, that they're rejecting, they're not appreciating these immense blessings that Hashem has given to them. And even they need correction and the correction that they get is Miriam is struck with uh, with Sahara, the, the often called leprosy, but we know it's not leprosy, right? You're reminded that, no, listen, there's only one servant in my house, and that is Moshe, right? Right, if there are prophets among you, they get dreams, they get vis visions, but, I speak to Moshe mouth to mouth, right? We have this idea, pe el pe. It's a very intimate. We understand that there's no riddles here. There's no confusion. Moshe speaks to Hashem as if he's speaking to any other person that we could speak to, right? And everyone else gets just a fraction of this. But we should be happy for whatever fraction we're given. So trying to find fault in Moshe for the gifts that Hashem has given him, including his wife. We also shouldn't be finding faults in the gifts that Hashem has given our brothers and sisters as a pretext for you know, complaining about them in general. So this idea of egoism and, and how it comes into conflict with our mission to draw closer to Hashem, it is universal throughout the nation of Israel, from the rabble at the bottom, all the way up to Aaron, Hakohen, and Miriam, the, the prophetess, Right, that this is an issue that is dealt with and is corrected through the journey in the desert. And we're going to see how this continues to be a problem until the entire nation, the entire generation has to be purified. Anyway, very rich, another very rich portion 
please share with me anything that you find interesting that I might have missed. Um, as always, like, share, comment, subscribe, and uh, until next time, be well. <laughs>